Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Dana Andrews in the story of John Hancock on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize a biography by Lorenzo Sears, the story of a man whose signature may well be the best known in our history, John Hancock. If you've ever visited the Library of Congress in Washington, almost certainly you've examined the actual document of the Declaration of Independence. And you'll have noticed that John Hancock's signature not only heads the list, but is written in letters so strong and firm that, as was said at the time, George III could read it even without his glasses. John Hancock, personally, was rather like his signature, strong and firm. He was also very human and a man of many talents. To play his part tonight, we have chosen one of Hollywood's finest and most popular actors, Dana Andrews. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. While the pleasure Christmas cards bring can never be measured... Isn't it good to know that Hallmark cards are priced the same this year as they were last year, and the year before, and the year before that, and that the quality of Hallmark cards has constantly improved throughout the years? Yes, today, just as for many Christmas seasons, that Hallmark on the back of your card is looked for and welcomed. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse presents Lorenzo Sears' John Hancock. Starring Dana Andrews. Many people had known John Hancock, but there was one especially, a charming old lady of 84, whose name as a girl had been Dorothy Quincy. Old people like to talk. They like to turn their minds to roam over the past, especially when their own past is already a part of history. History, yes. His name is in all the history books now. And yet when people ask me, what was John Hancock like? I find it hard to give a simple answer. He had so many different moods, gay and severe, Angry and gentle. You know, it almost seems to me there were many John Hancocks, and I knew them all. I am so proud of that. And, of course, the one I think of first is the young man. The way he looked when he came back from England. Oh, he was so handsome. So assured. Such a grand style in the way he looked and talked. His uncle was very ill and had gone to the house on an errand one morning. And it was young John who opened the door. Yes? Oh, I... I'm calling on Madame Hancock. Is she at home? Come in. May I ask who's calling? Well, may I ask who's asking? <laughs> well, I'm John Hancock, Mrs. Hancock's nephew. John Hancock? Well, I would hardly have recognized you. I'm Miss Quincy. Miss Quincy? Which Miss Quincy? Dorothy Quincy. Dorothy? <laughs> Why, you were a little girl when I went abroad. You've grown up. And those things happen with the passing of time, Mr. Hancock. Yes, evidently. Dorothy, my dear, how nice to see you. Good morning, Mrs. Hancock. Mother sent over some jellies for Mr. Hancock. Oh. She thought that might tempt his appetite. Well, that was very kind of her. Have you two young people been renewing your acquaintance? You certainly have. Dorothy's my favorite child in the entire city. And certainly the bell of the town. Yes. 
I can see why she would be. I beg pardon, but Mr. Hancock is asking for young Master John. So I'll go right up. Good morning, Uncle Thomas. Good morning, John. Come sit beside me. I have much to talk to you about and little time to say it. The doctor said you shouldn't tire yourself. Doctors always passing out pills and shouldn't. I am leaving your aunt well provided for. And in your trust, I am leaving my warehouses, my ships, and my faith in the future of these colonies we are trying to raise. You spent a good time abroad. I'd like to know that your mind, your heart, your energies are devoted now to your home. They will be. My real allegiance is here, not abroad. I'll fight for this land against all enemies. And I'll fight to make her the kind of land of which all men dream. A land where the liberties of the individual are sacred. Where the people are self-governed. Where You're they... talking revolution, my boy. We are all subjects of the King of England. I don't think we're going to remain subjects of the King of England. The King has gone too far of late with taxations. The Lord's Parliament has been passing reek of tyranny. It's not to be borne. If the rest of the lads we've raised in this country think as you think, then there will be revolution. And from revolution, true freedom. There will be revolution, Uncle Thomas. And there will be freedom. I wish I might live to see it. Even if you don't see it, you have helped sow the seeds from which it will come. Yes, there were many John Hancocks. There was the Cavalier, young and dashing. There was the Patriot, warm-hearted and cool-headed. And there was the man who, quiet with grief, admitted me to the Hancock house one other morning. I can never forget. Good morning, Dorothy. Oh, shall I get your bags out of the carriage? Servants have already taken the carriage around to the side. Come in. John, I, I'm sorry about the death of your uncle. Yes, it, it was quite a blow. We expected it, of course, but even so. Yes, of course. It was very kind of you to come and be a companion to Aunt Lydia for a while. I'm sure you'll be a most agreeable distraction. And she needs someone to take her mind off her loss. I was very happy to come, John. I... I had thought to be calling on you before this, but with all my uncle's affairs to take care of... I, I understand. I have been thinking of you. I have been thinking of you. Oh, excuse me. Jim, come in. What brings you here at this time of day? Uh, there's trouble in the dock, John. Your vessel, the Liberty, is in port, you know. Yes, of course I know. She's just come in with the cargo. And your captain got in a row with one of the English customs officials and locked him up on your ship. The crew is putting the goods on dock right now. Are they? Well, don't you think you'd better go down and make an attempt to restore order? No. You don't? Jim, the British have been seizing our sailors and forcing them to work on their ships. One of them was rescued only today. I can see no reason under the circumstances to honor the revenue laws or the representatives of the English crown. You can't openly defy the English crown. I do openly defy it. And in time, we shall all openly defy it. My ship is well named. I consider her name a good omen. The Liberty? The Liberty. <laughs> John, oh, thank 
goodness, your home. I heard the shouting in the streets. What has happened? Ha-ha, <laughs> there's been a riot. They've damaged the homes of the revenue offices, and they may have destroyed the revenue collector's boat. For all I know by now, they... You look glad. I am glad. This may lead to a war with England. Yes, it may. Do you want war? I want freedom for all of us. I don't want taxation without representation. I want this country to have its own government, its own leaders. You're talking revolution. You're talking treason. I'm talking revolution, but not treason. Dorothy, I'm talking loyalty. Loyalty to the original beliefs that brought our fathers to this country. We're not an English colony. We're a new nation. And we must show the world that we're a new nation dedicated to liberty. It's inevitable that we must fight, Dorothy. And the sooner begun, the sooner ended. And the sooner we can set to work establishing the kind of government we want to live under. You sound as though you actually believe we could win a war with England. We must win it. Yes, he often said that. It was part of his dreams. And there was poetry in his dreams. So that even his anger had a sort of poetry in it. As if he knew that history was going to be on his side. There was one night I sat in the study with Aunt Lydia. John was talking to Sam Adams in the next room. We didn't have to eavesdrop. You could have heard him all over the house. The devil take that blasted tea. I say let's dump it into the harbor. The king has threatened to transport all rebels to England for trial. Let's not lose sight of that, John. But, Sam, before he can transport us to England, he's got to capture us and get us out of the country, and that will take some doing. I could do with a good cup of tea right now. I'll brew you a cup in Boston Harbor. If there's any brewing to be done, I'll either hand it in myself. John... If we were to consider such a thing, which, of course, we would not for a moment, how would we get on board? I've thought of that. We'll put on war paint. There will be an unexpected Indian uprising. It can be done, Sam. We can get on board, dump that tea over, and get off. And no one will ever know who made the attack. The British won't think it's Indians for one minute. I know they won't, but they won't know who the exact people were. No one will ever know. Are you with me, Sam? Here's my hand on it, John. Oh, John, we're back safely. What happened? Well, if you'd like a cup of tea, you can have a fine, strong one for yourself from Boston Harbor. John... Where is this all going to end? To live and not to be free, Dorothy, is not to live at all. I don't want to die. None of us do. I want to live in this land, be a part of its growth. I want to raise children that will live as free citizens under an elected government. I want to plan a future with you, Dorothy. You want to plan a future with me, John? You knew that, didn't you? You've never spoken. I wasn't sure how you felt. These are difficult, uncertain times. I didn't feel I had the right to speak. In difficult, uncertain times, John, it is well to have some certainty. Dorothy, then may I go to your father? May I ask him for the honor of your hand in marriage? Nothing would give me greater happiness. I may be leading you into a life of great anxiety, even danger. Wherever you lead, John, I shall feel privileged to follow. Well, this has been quite a night for me. I've struck a blow for liberty and surrendered liberty, too. Dorothy, I shall remember the hope of this night as long as I live. The hope of living with you in a free country. We must achieve that hope. For those who live now, and for all who will come after us. In just a moment,
moment, we will return to the second act of John Hancock, starring Dana Andrews. In your family, do you put your presents under the tree on Christmas Eve? We do. And the excitement of that day. Every time someone goes through the room, they take a peek at the tags. Even if you have no curiosity about what's inside, you can't help thrilling to the beauty of the wrappings. Yes, gift wrappings are certainly part of the excitement of Christmas. And you can make your gifts the ones everyone reaches for and wants to open first on Christmas morning if you choose Hallmark Coordinated Gift Wrappings. You see, these are something different and special in gift wrappings. They're coordinated colors and designs styled by the famous Hallmark artists. The designs on the paper are scaled for the size of the box you're wrapping. There are ones for big boxes and little boxes. Gift wrappings that appeal to men. Delicate designs for your feminine gifts. And, of course, the right gift wrappings to delight the children. So this year, make it a point to wrap your gifts beautifully with Hallmark Matched Gift Wrappings. You'll find them at fine stores across the country. You'll know them by their beauty and by that familiar Hallmark and crown you always look for on the back of cards when you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of John Hancock, starring Dana Andrews. A young man growing up into a troubled age. A young man seeking to change the world. A young man whose dreams became actions. This, we can see, was John Hancock. But the old lady can tell us more because she too had lived through the troubled years, had seen the outbreak of war between England and America, had watched history come alive in her own town. Yes, John and Sam Adams were talking there late one night, and there was plenty to talk about. The whole countryside was tense with excitement. Lydia and I joined in the talk occasionally, but mainly we listened. It was great talk between those two. The talk of men who knew they were on the verge of tremendous adventures. And then suddenly a horse clattered up to the front door and a rider dismounted. Yes? Mr. Hancock? Yes. My name is Revere. I was appointed to watch for the signal in the belfry of North Church. Has the signal been set? Yes, two lanterns. That means the enemy under General Gage is marching to attack Concord. Captain! Yes, sir? Send one of your men to the meeting house. Tell them to start the meeting house bell ringing and keep it ringing for the rest of the night. Yes, sir. We'll have 150 men together before daybreak. I must go on with the message. Good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Revere. You see what I mean when I say there were many John Hancocks? There was the man of action, the leader. The patriot cheered by thousands as he rode through the streets. And then the serious, dignified statesman who came back to our house after he had been chosen president of the Continental Congress. Congratulations, John. We're so proud of you. Well done, John. Your uncle would be proud, too. Now, wait a minute. I've only been elected president of the Congress. I haven't done anything yet. You will. What is the first job you must do? Appoint a committee to draft a declaration of independence. Do you know whom you're going to appoint? No. I have to think about that a long time. This is one of our first important national documents. The men who draw it up must be of first importance to the nation. And the nation must be of first importance to them. Gentlemen of the Continental Congress, the following are my appointments to the committee to draw up the Declaration of Independence. Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. It is my pleasure to inform the President and the members of the Continental Congress that the Declaration of Independence is ready for their signatures. Mr. President, will you be the first to sign? 
I consider it a great privilege to be the first to sign this document. John Hancock. Yes, I knew John Hancock so very well. Memories of him come back to me now. Not in the order of history. Let history take care of that. But in the way life arranges them in my heart. Because I was part of that life. Of his life. Of our life that began on that happy day. Our wedding day. He beside me in the carriage after the ceremony. A young man then. So handsome. I said that before, didn't I? So handsome. Are you happy? Very happy. Are you? If there's a happier man in the colonies today, I'll eat him. <laughs> oh, that's a sweeping statement. You know, I must have ridden this road a hundred times and more during my life. And yet, today it seems as though I'm riding it for the first time. We're both riding it for the first time. Because we're riding it together. Someday we'll ride here with our children and we'll say to them, on this road your father and I drove on our wedding day. And our thoughts plans and dreams were of a future so beautiful it was almost unbearable. I won't remember thoughts and plans and dreams. I won't remember the road or the morning. No. I'll remember only you. Yes. They are all here with me now. John Hancock, first governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. First governor, and then ten times re-elected. And then my last, and perhaps my dearest memory of them all, John Hancock, when he was 57. And life had not been kind to him in every way. Not as kind as history had been. It seems to be getting dark earlier these days, doesn't it, my dear? Well, it is October, you know, John. How do you feel this afternoon? Oh, tired. Very tired. Should one be this tired at only 57? It hardly seems time. It's because you've been ill. When you're better, you won't tire so easily. I, I wish our children had lived to sit beside me today. The girl there, the boy there. Life is very cruel at times, isn't it, my dear? To have them both with you, love them. And to lose them seems unendurable at times. I shall die without descendants. There will be no child to live and carry my love for you on into the next generation. What John Hancock felt and was and thought ends here with my passing. You're in a strange mood, aren't you, my dear? You keep speaking as though this were the end. If it is the end. I'd like you to remember this. There have been only two real loves in my life, Dorothy. You and my country. I may not have lived to see my children gather strength and grow, but I have lived to see my country take its first unsure steps. I've lived to see those steps become stronger and firmer as a nation of men fought for freedom, achieved freedom, and learned what to do with it when it was theirs. I know not what men will remember of me, <laughs> anything at all, but I shall remember two things with great pride as long as I live, that you put your trust in me and that my countrymen put their trust in me. And one simple moment, long since over, will remain in my memory. The great moment of my lifetime. It is my pleasure to inform the President and the members of the Continental Congress that the Declaration of Independence 
is ready for their signatures. Mr. President, will you be the first to sign? I consider it a great privilege to be the first to sign this document. John Hancock. Dana Andrews and James Hilton will return in a moment. If you're like most of us, long about now, you're finding the total names on your Christmas card list and the total cards that you ordered are two different numbers. If that's your predicament, or if you expect to be supplying extra cards to other members of your family, here's a suggestion. Tomorrow, when you're shopping, pick up a couple of the Hallmark boxed collections of Christmas cards. I think you'll appreciate particularly the convenience of the Hallmark 25s. In these boxes are 25 Hallmark cards, all alike, and all designed with traditional Hallmark beauty. They're easy to shop for, too, because the design of the cards is printed right on the box cover, and the boxes themselves are small, and so no trouble to carry home. And they're the ideal way to buy the extra cards you'll be needing. You'll be glad, too, that these extra cards also have that Hallmark on the back. That Hallmark, which to everyone, everywhere, means you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Dana, for a really grand performance. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Mr. Hilton, for I felt it was quite an honor to be asked to play the role of such a great American. And thank you for inviting me to appear on Hallmark Playhouse. You're always a welcome guest. You know that, Dana. And tonight, because it's so near to Christmas, we thought you'd like to have one of our Hallmark Christmas card trains to hold all the Christmas cards you'll be getting during the holidays. Well, see, that's great. And if you don't mind, I think I'll give it to my son, Stephen. He's having a birthday this Saturday, and he's been asking for a train. Oh, well, in that case, you'll, cer you'll certainly need two. So <laughs> here's another one for Stephen. And, in fact, let's add two more for Catherine and Susan. We don't want anybody to be left out. Oh, of believe me, I didn't mean for you to take care of the whole Andrews <laughs> family. <laughs> but that's like you Hallmark folks, always doing the friendly thing, and thank you. Uh, what are you having on the Hallmark Playhouse next week, Jimmy? Well, we certainly hope you'll be listening then, Dana, because next week we shall tell our Christmas story, one that's already become a sort of Hallmark Playhouse tradition. Herta Pauli's The Story of Silent Night, the beautiful and true history of one of the most popular of all Christmas carols. We'll certainly all be listening, Jimmy. Good night. Good night, Dana. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs>